Um, the last session for today here in the auditorium um, is going to be about service delivery platforms. Um, we have seen a lot of talk on how NRENs can leverage uh, cloud, uh, cloud services and stuff. Um, in this session, we will look at uh, a number of initiatives by the NRENs themselves to actually shape in the way uh, we can leverage these clouds by, on one hand, uh, working with software platforms, for example, in, in the area of authentication and collaboration, and on the, on the other hand, on, uh, in the network layers, where we can do clever stuff um, to actually make it much easier for our institutions to use these cloud services. Um, we will start off with a, a, a duo presentation, actually, by uh, Carl Vincent and Neil Witheridge. Um, they're going to present on uh, how they are using OpenConnect to build uh, service delivery platforms. Carl is working for JISC NetSkills here uh, in the UK. Um, is, uh, uh, there is a technical uh, uh, consultant there and has been running the uh, JISC mail service uh, for the past years. Uh, Neil is uh, uh, working for Rnet in Australia, um, has been working in authentication and authorization services for about 10 years, and is one of the guys behind the Edgerome service in Australia. Um, and I'm happy to give the floor to them. Right. So this is, uh, this is going to be two mini presentations, for, uh, two for the price of one here today. Um, so this is a little bit about the, the pilot project that we worked on in, in JISC. Um, but we're first going to, for anybody that doesn't know about the OpenConnect platform, we there was a little workshop on it uh, on Monday morning um, where we, we kind of did a demo of, uh, of how to make it work. Um, but this is a, a platform developed by SURF in the Netherlands. Um, it brings together the federated authentication and group management onto a, a single platform, bringing together existing tools and applying lots of magic glue to make it all work together in a, in a relatively seamless kind of way. Um, they're using it for, for a big part of their NREN operations, um, but they've also opened the, uh, the, the platform up uh, and are encouraging other people to, uh, to use it for, uh, for other things. Um, so we've got two examples of that today. Um, here's a little bit of background about uh, what we were doing over at JISC. Um, as part of our remit, we run JISC Mail, which is uh, the academic mailing list service for the UK, um, though we have plenty of, uh, of people using it from uh, outside the country as well. Um, you know, it's a fairly old-fashioned service and, uh, compared to some of the things we've been talking about today. It's uh, been going in various forms for, for many years. Um, so it you know, provides e email lists, archives, uh, and a couple of other little things like simple file sharing and things like that. Um, the main customers for it are, are perhaps smaller than some of the people that we've been talking about in some previous sessions. I've been sat in, sitting in sessions about big physics research and things like that where you know, the, the, the collaboration groups throw lots of hardware and cloud work and stuff together. We get a lot of, uh, of ad hoc groups um, doing their research and collaboration on small topics, perhaps you know, in, in the kind of uh, areas where they, they get less local IT support. Um, it's quite a big service. We've got you know, uh, nearly a million and a half users, nearly 10,000 lists, and it's still growing, despite you know, people talking about email being uh, a bit old-fashioned. We still get more lists. Um, they're growing faster than we're tidying up the unused ones. Um, the way that we run it... Um, in the last couple of years, it's, uh, we've outsourced it. to um, We ran it on the list of mailing list platform, uh, and it's actually run to, for us by the, uh, the company that did that. It's Lsoft. They run it in Sweden for us. Um, but what we provide is the, is the service management and the help desk. Um, and what we, uh, we set out to do is to look at whether we could develop the service to add all of the other things that people are talking about, exciting new developments, but still keep it with the context of these kind of ad hoc groups that are self-managed and things like that, uh, to, to keep the audience similar to what they have now. Um, so we had this kind of vision at the start. This was uh, the start of 2013. We were, we were looking at this. Um, we talked about you know, different ways to collaborate on documents instead of just sending emails backwards and forwards. Develop the storage a little bit, um, the current storage 
platform is a bit like having an FTP site and uh, about as glamorous. And obviously, people use things like Dropbox and things like that, which are much slicker and so on. So we were looking at things like that. We talked about collaborative content ed editing and perhaps calendaring and things like that as well. Um, we wanted to continue to try and use you know, existing third-party tools and so on, you know, not just because uh, we didn't want to be necessarily developing all of these things from scratch, but also because we wanted to support the fact that they would change. Um, it was important that it was modular because by, you know, in a couple of years' time, there'll be something new that people want to use. So um, we wanted to stick with the kind of standards and uh, extensible modular format with that. So we, we looked uh, at OpenConnect as a, as a way of doing it. And this is one of our early diagrams of kind of how we, how we wanted to, to work. Um, and the idea was that uh, we have you know, other apps that already exist out there in the cloud. Uh, and what we're pr pr pulling in here is using the uh, OpenConnect platform to do the group mapping as well as the, uh, the single sign-on with identity providers from the Federation. Um, many of these services that you see now, they, they, that SAML is taking off. You know, people are, services are available with it. But you, though you can have the single sign-on, you still often have to go in and create a, your own group in again and again in each platform that you go into because the group data isn't shared. And we were hoping to look at how we could share some of that because we've got a group-based service. Um, here's a slightly simpler diagram, um, which shows a little bit about how uh, OpenConnect works inside. Um, the boxes in the middle are the parts that we used, used from it. Um, it consists of a SAML proxy, which allows you to connect your, your federation to your services, um, but also do some attribute manipulation in that process. It manages the group membership, and it exposes that, um, as well as through the SAML interfaces, it uses uh, OAuth and Voot as well to share some of that group information. Now, when we started this project, the, the Connect platform also had uh, an Apache Rave portal as part of it. Um, and, when, and when we undertook our project, we, uh, we, we worked with that a little bit as well. Um, things have developed since then, and uh, I think that uh, there isn't the, the portal part of it anymore, but we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so when we started this, um, it was a small development project, so uh, we, we, we tried, the first thing we did, obviously, is try and connect it up. Um, we discovered that there was quite, quite a few differences between uh, the way that... Uh, that we do things in the UK and the way the Dutch do things. Um, the Surf had created uh, the platform for their own use, and then we were one of the, the first people to try and deploy it somewhere else, and so we discovered uh, all of the little, uh, little points where we were, we were different on those things. Um, but we also had some of our own specific problems. Um, even today, not all of the UK's Federation IDPs are, are SAML2. Um, the Dutch have uh, got a much... Well, they've had their big stick out and got everybody upgraded. <laughs> so, so their platform was, uh, was designed only to work in that. So we were, we were already going to hit a problem where uh, we wouldn't be able to get everybody to, uh, to work with it straight away. Um, well, obviously, we also use different things in the encryption settings and things like that, um, which hadn't been compiled in. Um, that's one of the things that uh, the surf took on and, and made some changes to. So that should all be fixed now. Um, so it, it worked with some of our IDPs, particularly uh, we had a... a um, my host institution is it, it, at Newcastle. Uh, it worked, worked very well with us, um, but we, we, some other institutions we were having trouble getting it working with. Um, but we also, because of the way that GISMAIL works beyond the, the, uh, the education research community, um, we also have a lot of people who aren't in an institution, can't have an IDP, so we had to support that as well. Uh, so as part of our project to, do, to get the testing up and going, we, we run our own IDP to, uh, to get uh, people in and use and that works fine with the, with the Connects platform. Um, see, group membership is key to all of this. Um, Connects provides the, uh, the VOOT interface to, uh, to get group membership of all your members. Uh, and somewhere in there, a Grouper is, is providing uh, the, the management of that. And so there is also the tools that are available to, to connect Grouper systems up to things to, to get the data in and out. Um, there's a user management tool comes with the platform. Um, we developed that a little bit further into an alternative because we were doing our own management of our own IDP and, and built the tool together. And I think some of that has been fed back into the, uh, the OpenConnect platform as well. Um, we also need to make sure that when we were um, provisioning services on a per group basis, that, uh, that hooks were available that we could, that could trigger things off to make things uh, to work like that. Um, 
So that all worked well with, with the, uh, the Open Connect. The problem that we had, as I mentioned before, is, that, is getting the services to work with the group context. They were, they were all fine with the, the SAML login, the single sign-on side of it. Getting the group context in was, uh, was where a lot of the, uh, the heavy lifting had to be done. Um, so that's it. The uh, membership of a group is not the only thing that we needed to do. We also needed to think about um, metadata associated with the group. Um, things like you know, if, you, if you have a wiki associated with your group or a, a blog associated with it, which one is it? Which server is it on? Um, and things like that. Uh, and at the time, we didn't, there wasn't any space in Connects to put that in, so we built a little extra module um, to store that extra, extra information on a group-by-group -group basis so that things could be provisioned and you, and you knew which groups you were going to. So how did it work with us uh, fitting things together? Well, the other early thing that we hit was uh, obviously having outsourced our mailing list service provision. Uh, we didn't have it there to play with, um, to, to try and hook it up to other things. So the first thing we decided to do was to set up a shadow service using an open source platform. So we played with Simpa, um, the, the French platform for, uh, for mailing lists. Um, Works with the, with the code. It had an interface that was being developed for, for, for Vue in, um, integration. Um, and we had it up and running with, uh, with to, to the web interface, so you could go in and see your groups and create them from the Connects platform where the group already existed. Um, see, there is the downside to this that both SAML and Vue are very much designed for web things. Um, on an email list platform, that doesn't quite work because see, um, the actions are triggered by somebody sending an email message in, so uh, we need to look at the other things. You've got, you've got users so who aren't logged in at the time because they've sent the, the, it's just an email message that's come in, and some of our users haven't even used the web interface. They haven't logged in at all. They've been subscribed to a list, and they get their emails, and they're happy with that. They want to send emails, um, and that's all they want, so we need to, to, uh, to think about how that would work. So the, th the route that we looked at with that was to was to kind of sidestep some of these things, go for a, t a tighter integration between the two platforms um, by, by going straight into the, to the LDAP and grouper levels to, uh, to connect the lists up to the groups. But we wouldn't recommend that if you didn't need to, if you were using web services like some of the other things we brought in. Um, so the other th one of the other th uh, services we, we put together for our little pilot um, was to have group-specific WordPress blocks. Um, so we, we had to uh, develop some plugins to, to make these work, um, again, to get the group context in. But we did them as, uh, as ordinary WordPress plugins, so using the, the standard kind of nature for that, so uh, that worked pretty well. Um, group members all had editor roles on the blog. We didn't go very much further into, into whether there should be different roles associated with the tools. Um, but you, yeah, group, members of the group could edit the blog, everybody could, could read the blog, um, was the kind of way that we went for it for our pilot. Um, so we had these two plugins. Um, the SAML plugin is the standard WordPress one to hook it up to the SAML lot for the single sign on. And we, the one we wrote ourselves does the, uh, a bit of the provisioning and synchronizes the group membership so it knows whether you should be, uh, be an administrator or not using the Vue interface. Um, something else we put together was. Um, See, one of the, the things that we, we were asked the users about the kind of things they want, they always say, oh, we want Google Docs. Um, that might be a little bit challenging for, uh, for a small project to put together. Um, but we used a, pr a platform called Etherpad, which uh, you may have come across. It allows collaborative text editing, uh, to, not, not in the, uh, the full sort of Word experience that you get with Google Docs, but more in a kind of notepad type of experience. But you can do live co-editing. Uh, it's actually quite effective for getting uh, a bit of text collaboration done. Um, we run it as a web service. Um, you had the single sign-on with the SAML. That's uh, a fairly standard thing to come with the, uh, with the Etherpad. But we did have to modify the code so that it was pulling the group information from Voot uh, in that context as well. So what you had was you have a, se a set of documents. You could start a document within your group and everybody else would be able to see it, um, but it was only available to your group um, and you could collaborate on the document. Uh, and then we had the portal. We wanted to show people how it, how it worked, um, what information was available to their groups and where there was new things going on in there. Um, and we used the Rave portal that was, uh, that was in Connects platform when we started. Um, that required quite a lot of heavy work because 
again, we have this group context, which is very different. The, the portal is designed to be user-based context. Um, you go in, you get your own choice of which widgets you have wherever you want, um, and it's just specific to you. Um, we did some modifications with it, which we had um, a pro, a, the, pro, the uh, pilot version running, and I'll show a, a, a picture of it in a, a few moments, where the, the, the layout and choice of widgets that you have is controlled by the group that you're in, and the context of all the widgets changes when you change your group context, because you can be a member of more than one group, and if you change from, from your one group to the other, the context of all the widgets changed as well. So there was quite a lot of work put in to that portal experience. Um, and when we did our, our little user pilot with, uh, with a selection of users, we had, the, we had the WordPress blog that I've talked about, we had the Etherpad blog, we, we threw in a Twitter widget as well. Um, a lot of people already have things like, that, like, um, like Twitter presences and so on associated with their groups. And again, it's just a simple thing to show how you could extend some of the widgets um, using, using the platform. So you, know, you, could, you could put in a specific Twitter search associated with your group for a hashtag or a, a user, and the, the widget would show that based on the group you were in. Um, we were also pulling some mail information from our mail platform. It wasn't fully integrated because um, obviously with the issues with the, the mail platforms, um, but it was showing the, the mailing list associated with it as well. And here's a picture of what we had. Um, so this is an uh, Apache Rave portal with, uh, with a series of widgets in it. Uh, and as you can see just at the top here is your group selection thing. Um, and this little drop down contains all the groups that you are a member of when you're logged in. Uh, and these widgets are all contextualized to the, to the groups, that, the group that you have selected at the top. So there is a, the, the latest posts on the, on the WordPress blog, um, there's mailing list information from the JISC mail service, um, there's your Etherpad documents are showing here, and the, the appropriate Twitter search is coming through here. And what, when you uh, change the drop down up here to a different group that you're in, all the widgets are refreshed to show um, the, 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 the appropriate content for the new group. And when you interact with the widgets and click through to the real applications, it takes you there in the group context that you were, had selected at the time. So our experience with working with it, um, we had some fu fun and games with various uh, aspects of it. We had the, the SAML and the Federation interoperability um, and different ways of things happening in different countries and the, the, diff the, you know, the different standards and the differences between uh, the, you know, we can have a difference between the hub and spoke way that, uh, that SURF operate and the mesh format that we have in the UK um, meant that certain things were more complicated. Um, some of those things have been sm smoothed out and fed back into the, uh, the OpenConnect code now. Um, it was very, very complicated to deploy some of these things. Also, SURF were working on it. Um, they, they kind of hit a, a spurt of development as, uh, on the platform whilst we were trying to, to do it as well. So it, things were moving quite quickly, keeping everything in sync. Um, group data and the context to the, uh, to the applications is quite, uh, quite challenging, and, and it meant that we had to work on those applications, uh, which might affect our ability to, to use third-party sort of hosted things without having to run things ourselves, which was one of our aims. Um, and yet, the last, going to the last one there, that, that uh, most of the tools are focused on web. So if we were doing something difficult like email, this is a little bit different. We had to, to, to do extra stuff for that. Um, and we did pilot this with uh, a few select groups of users. We selected a few uh, lists from our existing Gist mail service, some people we knew. And uh, we had uh, some guys from Arnet and, and Surf who were also interested in the project using it, and we had the feedback from that. Um, the actual the users really liked the way that the, the widget switched and, the, and you had this group context and, it, and you could swap from one to the other and it all happened. Um, though they were, there was some, some user experience stuff with the fact that they were expecting the portal to be port personalized, but it was, it was, it was, it was tied to the group context, so only the, uh, the group owner could, could, could manage those things. Uh, and one of the key things is that users are asking, they ask for, for brand apps like Google Docs, um, things that they know. Um, but actually, if you provide something else which has the same functionality, uh, like some of the other sessions I've been in today where people have done the same thing with uh, things that re replicate Dropbox and things like that, then they're very happy with it if the functionality is there. Um, group ownership, the administration of it for the group owners was quite complex, but it is a more complicated system, so there would be uh, some education smoothing out the interface to do there. But uh, there was uh, a very positive feedback for it, so look to, uh, to take that on as a, as a way of developing our service. 
Um, there's just a couple of links up there in the slides, which yeah, we can download those from the from the Terrena site if you want to see some of the work that we've done. And the uh, the Open Connect URL was in uh, in one of the slides at the start. I'll just hand over to Neil to talk about his work. Hi, my name is Neil Witheridge. I am Arnett's Authentication and Authorization Services Technical Manager. Um, let me just go to the next slide to just explain a bit about um, how we use OpenConnect. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with OpenConnect. It basically acts as a SAML2 proxy and uh, a group proxy. So here um, so we see that we have a national federation and in Australia we have the Australian Access Federation which has its identity providers and its uh, service providers. Uh, we, are, um, we are a member of the Australian Access Federation. Uh, we um, are registered as a service provider in the Federation. And this allows the National Federation identity providers to access our connected service providers. So these are service providers that ARNET provides behind our Open Connect instance. Um, now the power of uh, the power of the proxy, of having a having a SAML2 proxy, is that we can also um, provide access to identity providers who are not in the national federation, and uh, some of our customers have SAML2 identity providers, but don't have a business case to to uh, join the Australian Access Federation, and uh, we can also support uh, customers who don't. Uh, who don't have a SAML identity provider to um, provide si the single sign-on uh, by providing a virtual home organisation. And we've been using the uh, switch instance of the virtual home organisation and adapting that to Arnett's own, own uses. So about Arnett, um, within this context, we're um, the Edge Roam Australia uh, national roaming operator. Um, so we're aiming to revamp our edge uh, operations administra administration and maintenance and provide access to services which are provided both globally and developed in-house. But hopefully um, one of the initiatives that the uh, global edge Rome is undertaking is to provide a global set of services that uh, can be used to uh, deploy and to run edge Rome and uh, we will use our, our Open Connects as a gateway, an SSO gateway to access those services. And as I mentioned, um, Arnett is not the Australian SAML Federation operator, that's the Australian Access Federation. Um, Arnett is planning to deliver cloud services, is already delivering cloud services, for example, Box.net and Zoom. Um, we have diverse uh, customers um, with respect to AAI, those with the SAML IDP who are AEF participants, those with SAML IDPs not in the AEF, and those without a SAML IDP. So um, that's why this Open Connect um, uh, proxy is, is uh, an important part of our authentication strategy. So in terms of value for, for Arnet, we have the SAML proxy functionality. Um, which provides that broad customer access. Um, I've, I've covered that already. Um, so we, we've called this um, Open Connect instance uh, services shopfront, which um, I guess just means that we are providing access to the services through to a, to a range of services through the Open Connect instance. Uh, also, it's referred to as an SSO gateway. It's a really a flexible service delivery platform which makes sense for... NRENs, um, NRENs having um, diverse customers and needing to, or wanting to provide a range of services to their customers. Um, providing a proxy on SSO Gateway also uh, allows us to um, implement instrumentation which allows us to do usage metrics and, um, and service monitoring uh, very efficiently and also supports service support and troubleshooting. Um, out of the box, um, Open Connect is, uh, the SP metadata is, is edge again compatible. So um, even though the Australian Access Federation currently doesn't support uh, edge again, uh, we can actually make uh, use of edge again enabled services. And uh, we have some 
uh, Edge Rome administrative services that um, are accessible um, via Edge Game. Um, in terms of the group proxy, um, several of those Edge Rome administrative services require group based access. Um, uh, uh, they um, provide um, commercially sensitive information, so we need to protect access to, to these services. So um, we will implement Teams using the Open Connect Teams um, application, um, uh, allowing our customers um, to, to create Teams themselves where, where that's appropriate. And we will also, um, we will also make use of the integration with external group providers. For example, the Australian Access Federation is in the process of creating a group provider which identifies who are researchers in, our, um, in the Australian um, uh, uh, educational sector. And in terms of future benefits, there are multiple third-party connected services which are most likely uh, very useful for RNET internally, if not pr to be provided to our customers. Uh, and also, very interested to, um, to look at the work that JISC has done, the, and JISC connects on their uh, open social gadget deployment, as this is really a, a neat way to provide um, lightweight utility services. So looking uh, in more detail at the EDGEROME uh, services, the administrative services um, that we provide, uh, we, we have um, services that provide deployment automation, services for operability testing and auditing, for monitoring, for um, EDGEROME metrics, aggregated and detailed institutional metrics, and also um, to provide end user support. Uh, so we have a configuration assistant tool, uh, which is um, uh, developed by the EDGEROME operations team, um, which allows institutions to um, uh, generate scripts for their users to configure their end user devices. Um, and we also want to provide the ability to troubleshoot EDGEROME um, allowing institutional support staff to trigger authentications and have access to um, Radius server logs. Um, these are just some screenshots of, of those services that are currently available. Um, the monitoring, uh, the um, service administration, the top left is the, um, a service developed by uh, the, the Greek NREN. Uh, we have the monitoring, uh, service and the um, uh, Federation metric service and the EDGEROME configuration assistant tool developed by the um, European EDGEROME operations team. So we'd like to provide access to these services um, and where we need to have protected access, we'd be providing access via our OpenConnect instance. And we'd also like to uh, develop, uh, well, contribute to development and provide additional EDGEROME services. Uh, we already um, provide detailed institutional metrics internally uh, within the EDGEROME Australia and we would like to provide um, protected access to institutions to this information as it is regarded as commercially sensitive information. In terms of support, one of the, um, uh, the shortcomings of EDGEROM currently is that it's very difficult for institutions to provide end user support. So we'd like to be able to provide these tools so, so that um, institutional support can trigger authentication events and have access to logs. And those services too, of course, need to be protected and uh, providing access via our OpenConnect SSO gateway makes sense for us. So this is what it will look like in terms of the overall architecture. Uh, we'll have the, um, uh, we'll, we ha have the, um, our Open Connect instance as a member of the Australian Access Federation, virtual home organisation, and what I've called here private identity providers or those who just want to access Arnet services. We have a bunch of EDGEROME uh, services there, and uh, we'll make use of the Connect, Open Connect group proxy functionality to access group information. In terms of cloud and global services that um, are being planned by Arnet, um, as I say, we already deliver Box.net and Zoom. Um, these services will be accessed and are currently accessed via 
the Open Connect instance. This is really in trial mode at, at the current time. But we also um, are, are planning to deliver global services um, and we're involved in the, the uh, NREN CA forum initiatives and in particular we uh, hopefully will be using our Open Connect instance to uh, provide access to services related to the real-time communications initiative which is SIP-based communications. Uh, these are just some screenshots from, from, the, um, from the cloud uh, service. So here um, currently um, when I, this was, these screenshots were taken, we had a number of Australian universities in our instance. We have a lot more now, but um, accessing the um, box act, the service, and uh, going to um, the box um, a page, um, clicking continue, and being redirected to the our Open Connect um, where you're from agent, and accessing the service. So, in terms of uh, deployment experience. Um, the Open Connect um, team provides a virtual, mach virtual machine um, deployment, so it was very um, easy to get up and, and running and explore, explore Open Connect. Uh, when it came to um, integration with the Australian Access Federation, I think we ran across the same issues as, um, as Carl reported in terms of support for various encryption um, methodologies used uh, for SAML. Um, uh, there was a stage where um, I was given time by the um, s developers uh, of, of Open Connects to actually sort these problems out. So there was, there was you know, that responsiveness there was much appreciated from SurfNet to be able to resolve issues as, as they arose. Um, with, this, with the Australian Access Federation, we have um, metadata, we have many identity providers. Importing metadata, um, I think, is an area too where we need to we, we need to see some uh, more flexibility um, at the moment. The the process of importing metadata is a little more um, uh, manual than, than perhaps it could be. And uh, in general, um, perhaps localization and uh, the customization could be improved. And I'm sure that's on the roadmap for for Open Connect. Uh, in terms of the um, group, ac group information access from Open Connect, uh, there are many examples provided and uh, there are Java and PHP and Python libraries readily available. And we've run joint uh, workshops with, um, with SurfNet um, for Australian developers and uh, that's, that's worked well. And that's it, thank you. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Neil. Is, are there any questions? We have time for one or two. Yes, over there. Uh, hi, my name is Leonidas Poulopoulos. It's not a question. I'm the lead developer of uh, DJNRO. So I'd like to invite you tomorrow at uh, the Jerome session to see the, the advancements in this platform. Thank you. That sounded like spam, but... <laughs> 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 nice to meet you. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, thank you, Neil. Thank you, Carl. Um, we will now move to a totally different ball ballgame. Um, uh, well, from my perspective, I'm uh, more on the higher layers. We will now go to the lower layers, so to say. Uh, we have Damir here. Um, he works for the Creation uh, Academic and, Net and Research Network, uh, where he's uh, head of the Network Operations Center. Um, he's also a task lead for uh, JN3+, and he will present uh, the work that uh, he's been doing there. Go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Neil, for the announcement. Thank you all for being here on this late lecture. Uh, I will present uh, in my... Uh, hopefully short presentation, what we are doing in Jean 3 Plus project, uh, the project that has started uh, one year ago and will have, still have one year to go. Uh, my task is part of uh, joint research activity number one that is doing the network architecture for Horizon 2020. That's EU project that we are looking how the network will look like in 2020. Uh, my task is task number two. And we are researching uh, what the network architecture for cloud services should look like. So we are going now on the lower layers. Uh, when we started uh, to work on our task, we were really asking what the cloud service 
or cloud service providers, users really need from the network? Uh, you can get simple answer, probably you already had in your mind. You need quality of service, lower latency, whatever. But in the end, uh, what we find out that what user and probably the cloud service provider wants is simplicity. Uh, it wants an easy access to cloud service provider and probably an, uh, an easy choice of the cloud service providers. Uh, when we start working on this task, we started collecting use cases uh, of the cloud services for the campus users. Uh, we, we focus uh, mostly on the big data user. We are not talking about individual user who will probably do not need this high quality bandwidth or whatever. We are, using, uh, we are looking at the big data users. Uh, Jant Network is already connecting a lot of big data users. And I think the, the first uh, keynote speaker at the opening plenary he was talking about the importance of big data for his research activity because he generates a lot of big data in genomic, genomics field and whatever. Generally, we don't care what the big data, but this is a really large num number of the big data. Also, we are looking at the users who are creating uh, high-speed streaming uh, of uh, experimental data between one location to another. Uh, they have to store this uh, data somewhere. They, they are using the cloud for the storage, for the processing and whatever. Uh, we are also using, uh, looking how the data is distributed between uh, the few location that we call in the cloud connections and also between the cloud's location. And also what we notice that some of the university already have uh, the cloud service provider connection to their, uh, to their local network. Usually they come with dark, dark fiber and they are directly connected to the university, uh, not only through the Android network, but directly. Uh, also, uh, we are seeing that voice over IP approach with mobile data access, especially with LT, LTE uh, network and timely access will grow and also will switch to the clouds. <coughs> this picture is general use case infrastructure for provisioning. You can see on one side the user and virtual resources all around the network. Uh, user needs it for storage data, data filtering, uh, processing, archiving, uh, uh, disaster recovery, whatever needs. And what we created was a bridge. <coughs> the bridge between the user and the cloud service provider. Uh, we call this open cloud exchange point that could be located inside the Enron or somewhere in the network. And it assumes collision or collapse backbone for connecting all the members of Open Cloud Exchange. So here are our short definition. Uh, what we really want to do is to reuse Internet Exchange uh, point that already exists. We want to create, create physical point of presence. Uh, and at this point, will serve to connect the cloud user and cloud service providers. So generally now the internet exchange point works like exchange point, uh, peering point between different domains, but we want to connect, uh, we want to create a point that is a uh, peering point between the cloud user and cloud service provider. We also, <clears throat> from this point, we want to create scalability gr for growing number of uh, members. Uh, we can also control some quality of service parameters at this point. And <clears throat> important, things, uh, important thing that we also discovered, we want to solve the last mile issue. Uh, most of the last mile issue was, uh, in our case, solved by, we will only accept uh, from layer zero to layer two uh, connection to this open cloud exchange point. So we want to remove BGP and all other IP overheads. We want to have the data that can simply stream over this point from the user to the cloud service provider and back. Uh, <clears throat> also, what we want to avoid from the Internet Exchange point is uh, all this kind of politics around policy writing, etc. So we are saying we don't have a third party or some kind of brokering service that is inside this box. So the broker who can decide or charge uh, the exchange of data between the user and the cloud service provider. 
So we are saying all the members who are connected, we are layer, uh, layer zero to layer two circuits, or lambdas, ethernet, whatever, uh, are trusted third party service. Between them, they can establish dynamic federations, can establish peerings, whatever they like. Uh, and we also have trust and introducer for dynamic trust establishment. I will talk about it shortly. So in general, uh, this is how topology model and connectivity looks like. Uh, we have center point that we call open cloud exchange point. In Jant, we call it the GO6, that's Jant open cloud exchange service. Uh, these nodes are the user or the cloud service providers. They are connected uh, to, to this point. We are layer zero, dark fibers, whatever, or layer two, whatever links. So these nodes are users and uh, cloud service providers. They can make any to any connection. We are at that point. We don't care which one. Uh, we, we can provide in this point the topology exchange information, which is probably needed. You need to know at which port or VLAN this node is connected. And also what we are, we are in early development. We are not started to, to use the other uh, research activities that are working in such a hand. And we're also looking at SDN control over OCX switching, because there has to be switching between all the nodes. Uh, since we have a center point, we can also look out at the quality of service parameters, like bandwidth, speed, jitter, latency, and whatever. <clears throat> when we talk about trusted third parties, we are saying that everyone who is connected to this point can make any-to-any -any connections, but they all have to be trusted third parties, so they have to believe that I'm pairing with the node that is connected to the uh, OCX point. That's why we are also talking about some kind of trusted uh, certificates and CA repository. So we can, for example, reuse uh, the card that's Terena Academic uh, CA repository, so you can see who is connected to the OCX box, OCX point, so you know that you are pairing directly with the connected nodes. We also can provide service registry and discovery, uh, and also some kind of SLAs between the nodes can be established. <clears throat> uh, when we talk about the placement of this OCX point, layer zero to layer two connections between the user and cloud service providers, we had different kind of scenarios. Should we put a single point that is possible exchange. This is an example of the single point. It could be inside the giant network, or it could be at an Arian network. For example, giant is also peering with major tier one networks, and also they have peering with uh, some very big cloud service providers. But also some of the uh, network research, uh, uh, national research networks are also peering with major uh, cloud service provider. And they provide the service locally. So you can do this locally, or you can do this globally. So you can have uh, Jant O6 point, and you can have O6 point at your local research network. And if the user wants to access cloud service provider that is not connected locally, it can use Jant network as a cloud carrier network to get the access to cloud service provider that is outside its peering current peering domain. What is really important that these are uh, layer two to layer two, layer zero to layer two connections. <clears throat> uh, since we are uh, in very, very early development, uh, in November we, start, we, we finalized some things and started to develop and design this service. Uh, we have the white paper published. It can be found on, it can be found on the Jant, uh, web page. Uh, we are also doing the security topology and the protocol use cases. Uh, we also made a demo for this Terena conference just to show how this could work. Uh, this demo is done manually. We are not using any advanced uh, or software defined uh, network solutions, but probably for the next demos we will do that. Uh, we are also participating very much in standardization contribution and for IEEE InterCloud Testbed Initiative to expand this uh, open, cloud, uh, open cloud exchange 
idea. Uh, <clears throat> what we prepare for this conference is a very simple demo. We have one user that's University of Amsterdam, and we have two cloud service provider. One is uh, publicly funded Okanos cloud service provider that's Greek uh, network, uh, Greek GRNet project, and Cloud Sigma that is a commercial cloud service provider. So we have a user that is streaming high, high amount of uh, 4K video data, and they need some kind of processing. That's big data generated uh, traffic. So you can see on this picture we can use standard routed internet, or we can use uh, open cloud exchange points, where this traffic can go uh, from layer two to layer, uh, from layer zero, or lambda switching, or Ethernet switching. In our demo, we just simplify things, and we are using Q and Q between the remote sites. So we have three open cloud exchange boxes at the border of each NRAM. We have one uh, in uh, the Netherlands, that's a Netherlite exchange point. We also have one in GRNet and one in Switch that are using to connect the nodes or the cloud service providers. Uh, University of Amsterdam can, uh, has a scheduling software that creates and destroys virtual machines in each of the cloud service provider. What is important that these virtual machines in Okeanos and in Cloud Sigma are the same local network as University of Amsterdam. So <laughs> you are doing this, <laughs> you can say it locally, they're in the same network. So that's how we avoid the last mile issue. No firewalls, no security, not whatever. These virtual machines are in my network. I can choose the number of virtual machines I need from Arcanos or the Cloud Sigma. What we are also doing in the demo in synchronization between these uh, cloud service providers. So the, the data goes uh, also from the Okeanos to Cloud Sigma just for the data recovery, backup, whatever, if the link broke down, the processing will continue. <coughs> so if you're more interested in, in our work, uh, we have prepared the demo for tomorrow, one o'clock during the lunch break on Jean Boot. We'll have a light demo, and you can see not only how the VMs are created or destroyed, but how this uh, open cloud exchange idea really works on, <coughs> in our case, a layer two, layer two, layer two path. Also, we have a poster in uh, TNC area where you can find out more details. But also, I'm here, and my team members are here, so I would like to ask you if you have any questions or whatever, please do. Thank you. Thank you, Damir. Are there any questions from the audience? Well, I at least have one. Um, in your pictures, you showed mostly a setup where um, the exchange would be a national thing or in Géant, uh, within the Géant domain. But could you also use this to say if you're a sufficiently large collaborative organization like exists outside there to use that to sort of bridge over multiple domains through multiple countries and possibly even uh, say between Europe and the US, something like yeah. that. You can do this is a service on top of every service. So if your university is creating a big number of data and it's probably not using that much of traffic to your NRAN, but it's also have uh, other connections to the cloud service provider, they can all they can also build Open Cloud Exchange box. What is important for the user, he can easily, when he's connected to the Open Cloud Exchange, he can easily choose whatever cloud service provider he wants because they're all connected here. So we are just simply doing stuff that should be already done. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, thank you. Then I would like to continue with the next speaker. Um, we will go a bit higher in the stack uh, now with a presentation from uh, Andreas uh, from uh, Uninet. Andreas is going to talk about FIDE Connect. Um, Andreas has been working in Uninet uh, uh, as a researcher, um, mostly on authentication and authorization infrastructures. Um, 
there was a little bit of talk about food previously by these two gentlemen, and well, he's one of the principal uh, authors of, of that, but he's also pretty well known for being sort of the mastermind behind stuff like Simple Samuel PHP and Foodle. Um, well, Andreas, take it away. Thanks. <coughs> so uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, FID Connect, which is um, outcome of research and development activity at Uninet. Uh, the current status is an operational prototype from which I'm going to present a few demos. Uh, a production level service is uh, currently in planning. So we are observing that there is a gap between the services need that are requesting and what we have of a supporting middleware infrastructure. And this gap is, uh, is uh, increasing because the services expect more from us. What we have today with the Federation has a few issues that service providers bug us about, requests. Uh, we does not properly support mobile. We does not properly support groups. Does not properly support services that connect, act, talk to other services. The setup of the service provider is uh, rather complex. Even if you have software making it simple, you have the complexity on your side. Uh, and we have cross-federation, which also is not as smooth as we would like. So we're thinking about how can we offload the complexity and the effort service provider needs, making that into a, a service. Um, we have been working with SAML for all these years, and it's great for single sign-on, but not for everything. So we're trying to think new uh, and uh, build as We've seen OpenConnect and others as well, uh, and other architecture. So trying to, to build this from the bottom up, uh, we learned today that everything is about APIs. We think that that's fair. APIs uh, are great. So uh, let's build on top of, of them. We have the core of an HTTP API. On top of that, the de facto standard for doing the session uh, is uh, UAuth 2.0. We're going to use that. On top of that, we would need a layer of authorization management, doing uh, workflow, doing uh, namespacing, scopes, uh, access control, etc. And then on top of that, we put all the services. Uh, we have a set of services which we would like to, to extend. Uh, so we would like to, when we have this layer of UO2 already, it's inevitable to, to support a thin layer of authentication on top of that uh, as an alternative to, to what service provider today have with, with SAML. Uh, we're following the OpenID Connect standardization, which is a promising standard that seems to be the, 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 um, the choice. Uh, we're seeing possibility of doing profiling and, uh, and uh, specifications on top of that to map attributes and semantics from the educational research community uh, like every person into those specifications. We have work on groups uh, which where we use Woot. I think also worth mentioning here that as we are talking with different implementation, different software stacks, with the different environments, like we have OpenConnect, FID Connect, we will have tons of others also, hopefully. Uh, we need to collaborate to standardize on some of these interfaces, and there are all already good collaboration between Uninet, uh, Surfnet, and a few others about group exchange, which is probably the primary first goal of, uh, of service to support on this new uh, infrastructure. Uh, we are currently, Voot is not, not stable, we are cur currently looking into extending the, the information model and building that on top of Skim, uh, which is another standard for, for doing uh, provisioning and groups and users in the cloud. Um, so that's important work. In addition, we're looking into doing a people search API or white pages, or what we would like to call it, allowing services to have users searching for other users. 
to make user interfaces, having people acting, searching for other users to collaborate with, instead of having to type in their uh, user IDs and, uh, and these uh, not user-friendly ways of uh, setting up access controls and groups. Another example of what we have spent some time, some effort into is activity streams, uh, aggregating activities, events from different collaboration tools, presenting them in a stream um, to make a good overview from the context of a group or a project room or something, instead of having service specific uh, streams of uh, activities. Uh, we have an, oh. We have this uh, plus plus. We see that there will be tons of other needs for doing central and controlled uh, handling of new services. We have a few use cases already of new things that it makes sense to provide over a central uh, um, service infrastructure. And then, also important, we would like to offer infrastructure for third party APIs to, to connect to each other. So we have some supporting tools for that as well. So, all this is backend only. All this is APIs, and it's no user interface, not whatsoever in this stack. But in addition, we need a few other things. Uh, user interfaces, apps, uh, which are completely independent, all is using the APIs on the previous slide. We have, importantly, the authorization dialogue, it connecting the service to the API, to the user, informing the user, telling the user what's going on, what are you going to, to give permission to. Users are already familiar with such authorization dialogues from all the social services that they are using on a daily basis. Uh, we are putting this into an educational context, asking them to, to access services or APIs that's uh, in our environment. We have uh, built um, an application engine to simplify developing user interfaces on top of this infrastructure. Um, First, we thought this might be something that we offer to third parties as well, but currently it's kind of only the internal engine that we run all the internal applications on. Uh, we have built a few applications that's useful to this platform. Uh, we have a group apps that allows users to uh, create groups, add users, manage groups. Um, we are working on an app store, we have an activity stream, we have an API inspector for developers, documentation and a dashboard for developers to register applications, um, and a few others. Workflow is incredibly important and a very fundamental part of this architecture. Um, and it has to do with uh, simplifying the, the process of uh, uh, clients requesting access, administration personnel granting access, etc. The developer dashboard is the entrance for the developer, for the client to get access to the platform, to request access to the APIs, to the services. Uh, and it should be one single point of entry where the service provider can control everything. We have a group engine that supports the group's API, doing caching, doing ad hoc groups from the group's app, uh, and then co uh, collecting parallel requests to several other authoritative sources of groups that already exist in our community. We have, this is an example of the, the front end, uh, the app for managing groups. You can view groups that are fetched from elsewhere and you can, you can navigate and you can create and manage new groups as well. Uh, this is some also sneak preview into the new information model supporting group types and, and a bit more information about our groups. Uh, anyone can, can create new groups uh, being available to, to uh, in all the services running on the platform. Uh, here also we see the interface for adding 
new members to the groups which are using the White Pages API. So instead of entering user IDs and these kind of things, you search the names, you get an entry and you, you add them. Um, one example, but there are also other use cases where it's useful to, to be able to find people. This is also behind the API authorization layer, which means that you can control who is going to be able to search for, for who. So you can control people, students can only search for your students within their own organizations, etc. if that's uh, needed. Examples of uh, uh, prototype activity stream front-end. Um, the intention of the activity stream is to uh, have, as I mentioned earlier, a stream focusing on groups rather than applications, where applications input to a central uh, per group stream, uh, making a good overview for, for, um, um, for uh, end users. Also, we see that, um, let me wait. Also have tried to implement demos of, of uh, open groups that you can subscribe to, to be able to get information and news public events from, from uh, public uh, groups to get more information, to get uh, updated. Uh, funny that uh, it was also mentioned uh, Etherpad demo uh, on the previous uh, presentation, so we've done that as well. Uh, and we did uh, integration with the Friday Connect platform using Etherpad, which is non-intrusive because we are only based upon what to, we can keep the whole code within the extension layer of, of uh, Etherpad, uh, doing uh, Express.js middleware layer, uh, extracting groups and authentication. Uh, no external dependencies whatsoever uh, because of the extreme focus on simplicity for the service provider. Really important. Um, yeah. Also something that I returned to, which we called auto-configure, which is an even simpler way of configuring these things. <coughs> this could use cross-federated access to the applications, the authorization dialog giving access. Here is a new, new dashboard uh, listing all the groups uh, or all the documents on Etherpad and each document related to one group creating a new document uh, associated a group, public or not, and then create. Then access control is, is uh, automatically configured for that group, for that, that uh, group. This is an interesting uh, feature which is intended for the API developers, for the data owners that would like to give access to their third-party API, but does have the resources to actually manage all the effort of doing a registry, access control, workflow, uh, authentication, uh, all this time. So we allow third-party developers to register their app in the same developer dashboard as I showed you earlier, uh, register their API instead of their client. Uh, they will have a third-party, their, their, a separate domain for their uh, the API, which will be protected by an world server, supported by authorization workflow. They set up their scopes and they control who is going to access it. Uh, new clients might request access to this new API, uh, controlled by standard uh, OAuth. Uh, everything is self-service. When they're eventually users accessing the client, sending requests, uh, there is a trusted channel between the third-party API and the API gatekeeper, adding stuff in HTTP headers about clients, about users, about groups, um, and about scopes, meaning that it will be really, really simple to add an authorization layer at the third-party API, and we hope this could be a kind of motivator for really accelerating the accessibility of opening up uh, access to new APIs at universities. Few things that we have not solved yet. Uh, still a lot of implementations to do. Uh, all the contracts, the legal works has to be uh, worked on, payment model. And also we are thinking about the smooth logout experience when we combined 
federated environment with single logout, what web applications are mobile. It's difficult to get that uh, in a good, uh, to work in a good way when we have a requirement that we really would like to support logout in a good way. A few more stuff. Just have to check my time. I'm fine. Great. So, App Store. I was thinking to not uh, say too much about it uh, because then I can have something to come back and present in TNC next year. Uh, but we have real ambitious plans for doing something cool on, on, a, on an App Store in this platform, uh, showing the availability of applications and to control the portfolio of services for the institutions. So we have done some work on what we call widgets, uh, which is uh, functionally similar to what we've seen with Open Social, but using standard web technology, uh, using iframes with a federated access, uh, doing some tweaks with SAML to make it work uh, well, and then look into the possibility of doing communication between a host or a service and then a widget uh, using this functionality, trying to see can we standardize some of these messages to see what, how can we improve user experience from, for user accessing a lot of collaboration services uh, to make a better a harmonized experience. Uh, and it seems that there's a lot of funny and cool things that you, you can do. Um, a few things that I can show you. We did a demo with Adobe Connect widget, which is really simple to be used anywhere. It's rather a, just a snippet of HTML and JavaScript that you paste into your template on your collaboration tool, and it will pop up as a widget. It is completely separated from the environment, but we can standardize on the protocol where it communicates, setting the context of, of uh, the, in example, the groups, the current group that you are operating in. So you can have a surrounding application or, or a collaboration tool switching between groups and it can, can follow and detect the change. Uh, yeah. But uh, it's, uh, I like this demo because it's so simple. The, the whole functionality, and there's a lot of things going on, but the functionality is as simple as just a button. There is uh, Adobe Connect uh, API that's used in, in behind, so when you're in a collaboration tool, uh, you, you are in a group, you get a button for that specific, uh, let me show, show again this, uh, allows you to, to join a uh, meeting room and then it's a text, an ongoing meeting in one of these uh, rooms and you click on it and you get to an automatically created Adobe Connect meeting room for that specific group where access control is already managed so only users within that group can, can, can join. It's really useful to, to add as an added feature into existing collaborate, collaboration tools. A demonstration of uh, what we call auto configure, which is uh, a widget that you can include on a prepacked service provider or application to simplify uh, registration at the platform. So we're using this front channel communication to set up hello, I would like to, to register, send back the configuration, and then let, allow the user to authenticate uh, at the widget and then. Uh, send back the credentials to the application. Very, very simple, and I'd say also, because it's simple, we also can, can make it uh, sufficiently secure and more secure than sh shifting around uh, SAML metadata by email. So here is a vanilla WordPress installation. We just drag and dropped a new, new um, plugin. The plugin got a separate page the page loads a widget. I'm not authenticated yet, but I then authenticate into this widget within the plugin of WordPress. So at this point, I'm just a standard uh, administrator at the WordPress. Here I get the credential uh, or the configuration from the WordPress sent to, to this application. I decide to register, sending back credential 
no WordPress is configured automatically and I'm logging in for the first time doing the authorization screen for this new service registered already, allowing this and then I sent to the role management which also is included in the, the um, now I'm mapped as an administrator to the current user that I was logged into. I'm set using the groups to set up t uh, mapping roles uh, into WordPress to existing uh, platform groups. Um, so now in a few few seconds I have uh, Donna Vanilla WordPress uh, installed a plugin, connected it to a platform, logged in for the first time, mapped ad administrator users and set up role access management. Really simple. So this is kind of an extra effort for developing the plugin but it makes sense for these services that are used by a lot of of provider because you can streamline and simplify the registration process. Here's a few other um, demos doing uh, integration with the activity stream. Here is a widget that allows you to, that's embedded in a random blog, which allows you to post links to the activity stream of a group. And here you can see that uh, there is another collaboration tool showing a group stream where you pop up a new uh, activity. So it's an example of how you, how you embed these widgets that are group, focusing on group on new services to enhance the user experience. And that's, that's it. Okay, thank you, Andreas. Are there any questions regarding the Feide Connect projects? Going once, going twice. I have one then. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, the, um, the integration of the platform into the services still requires effort. Um, can you say a little bit about that? Because you showed you created a WordPress plugin. Um, should we now go off and do this for every platform? Um, I mean, actually, uh, Carl re referenced uh, a similar issue where uh, sort of maintaining that and, and updating the service providers, so the, the services, uh, is actually the biggest, or was one of their biggest efforts, I think, uh, integrating groups and stuff into that. And could you say something about that? Yeah, yeah, there's uh, different... Uh categories of, of service provider then that you have. One thing is kind of all the generic collaboration tools, these uh, Etherpad, WordPress, all these tools that uh, is generic and everyone can use and can be shared. And then it's the matter of someone taking the initial step of doing the implementation. Uh, we, at, as we aim at, at uh, the extreme simplicity of the integration, the work of the integration itself is really simple, but as you know, it really varies a lot from the different applications, how complex it is to really get, get that into the, the role, ex the externalization of uh, groups into to the, the groups and role uh, model of the application. Um, so um, so that, that varies and obviously it makes sense to, to start with the ones that are uh, prepared for such, uh, such uh, but I think good software design should aim at, at uh, doing uh, integration points for users and groups and that, uh, et cetera. So I hope that in the future we will have more, more uh, services that uh, is simple to, to integrate. Another category is kind of like our community, which actually do more interpretation of the groups than just generic groups, but use groups as the course that you are subscribed to, things like that. That's, uh, that, then I see uh, more specialized services that are t aiming at our community, making use of uh, deeper understanding of the semantics of the information from the platform. And then I see uh, a very good business model where they are, are, and they are screaming or asking for more information, more from a, a central point of view, because right now the situation is that they get authentication, okay, as a one-point integration, but then they have point-to-point -point integration to get all the other data from tons of, of different sources. Uh, you, which you like is, uh, like a campus LDAP and stuff like that, you mean? Etc. Yeah. Yeah, uh, exactly, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? 
Go right ahead. I'll just give him my mic. Thank you, Christian Panagy uh, Just, uh, just for curiosity, what what was your motivation to do it on your own and not to uh, to build on co Open Connect? Good question. I think that this work started several years ago, where uh, uh, where I think that uh, there was more differences than it is now. Uh, I think Surf Connect has gone in a direction where they are moving a bit away from open social, uh, doing more on uh, APIs, doing more what more more uh, simple APIs. I assume that Surf Connect or Open Connect will develop in the future to also support uh, multiple uh, new services in addition to that as well. So right now, there's as you've seen through the demonstrations, there is a lot of things that have, we have done that is not available in Surf Connect, so obviously that was no, uh, no option. Uh, also, I think what's really important is when we have overlap, which I think we have when it comes to groups, uh, because uh, we are having the same types of services, the same needs, uh, and having a similar model, uh, we do collaborate on the interfaces, and I think that's the key. Uh, there will be a different software for different uh, to fit better into local architecture. We have uh, uh, some different architectural cho choices when it comes to how we would like to build this platform in Norway compared to to, to Netherlands. Uh, we would not like to touch and modify our existing FIDE service. We would like to build something beside uh, to to. Uh, to be an, in addition. So there are some changes, but it's really important that we continue the collaboration on the information model and the protocols for exchanging data. Uh, and we do already with groups, and we will continue that. We do actually uh, in, in the John 3 Plus uh, group uh, with uh, both me and, and uh, Surfnet and others. Uh, so I think uh, maybe in the future also because we focus on standardizing protocols, we might maybe pick components that can be used between the different platforms as well. So, uh, uh, yeah, definitely. As a quick response to that, uh, one thing that is very clear from Andres' presentation is that uh, his front-end stuff is very good and very strong, where the OpenConnect stuff focuses currently more on service integration. Um, and actually, I see a pretty interesting combination of the two as another possibility. Um, but well, that's for the future to explore, I think. Um, Hans Peter. Uh, my question is working, yeah. My question was around that. Uh, c can we combine both, basically, uh, Surf Connect or Open Connect and, and, and your solution? So that would be uh, excellent. From my perspective, that would be a very interesting thing to explore. So, yes. Yeah. And is, yeah. it, is it open as well, what you developed? Yeah, sure. So we Currently, can it's. Uh, it's a prototype, uh, but it's already the code is available on, on GitHub and it will be s stabilized more and being easier for third parties to, to test and into, uh, to, to use as well. Uh, one thing that I think uh, when we talk about different platforms and uh, uh, collaboration, what I think would be the most important, important part of, uh, of all would be all the different, as you asked uh, earlier, Nils, about the integration, uh, groupification uh, of uh, the components where we add into the service providers. Uh, I hope that we could reuse as much as possible of those integrations so that I can pick a lot of integrations for collaboration tools that you have already done uh, and simply uh, combine them into other platforms and the other way around. Also, one thing that we need to explore in the future that we have not solved yet, but is uh, uh, something that needs more work is how, I guess, one thing when we see which kind of software is in one question, but the other thing that is, uh, is uh, different is, of course, the deployments. So we have two deployments. You have one deployment, we, I have one deployment. I think the current state we have been able, I think, on both, both platforms to, to, to reach global interoperability when it comes to authentication part, where we have done through Edugen and other cross-federation initiatives, we do uh, do work with both SurfConnect and 
try to connect to log in and combine with users elsewhere. But we have not yet reached the same state for the group and other data uh, sources. Um, that's something that we are thinking a lot on and uh, will hopefully solve in, in the future so that it's uh, a global namespace for groups where it's a way for, I think it would be, one way would be where, where we see one, there is a standardized protocol that we already have between the service providers and the one single point of entry, which is the local national platform. And then I see an option where all the national platforms are kind of super nodes having a separate layer of communication in between to support, better support a global uh, scope of, of uh, more than just authentication like groups and authorization. Okay. May I? Yeah. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Perhaps, <laughs> perhaps a little other question. You, you show the activity stream and you have the identity of all the people uh, you want to put in groups. Does that mean you are actually creating a new identity out of the, the various identities which are available at universities or how, how do you manage that? Well, I'm, I'm not sure if I, I understand. When it comes to activity streams, you are asking for... So, how do I become a, a user in that activity stream? I, I, am, I only have an identity at, at my institute. I don't have an identity at, at a central point somewhere. So oh. how do you use collaboration over multiple institutes and things like that and everybody is in the same activity stream or you can find everybody. Yeah. Have, have so basically one directory for everybody in education. So, so the way uh, the activity streams works right now is that is focusing on, on uh, uh, is a central service with an API, which have a separate stream for each group. And there, as a user, you have an identity, and data is pushed, events are pushed into the activity stream uh, related to both uh, clients and or groups or, uh, or, or users. So it's your standard uh, identity or, or user that is behind uh, events that are, or um, activities that are put, um, pushed into activity stream. Although in some cases, uh, the applications or clients may push events or activities on behalf of you, then you have authorized that they can do so when you, act, in example, upload a document at Box or something, uh, they might have the token to act on behalf of you to push a token to notify the activity stream of the group where you are um, doing something. Uh, but uh, there is an assum assumption there that, that uh, everything is related to, to groups and in reality there might be several other ab abstraction levels as well where you not are, as a collaboration user, you are not working within a group space but you are working within a project room or something else that has few, uh, a few steps of abstraction until you reach the group group uh, object. So uh, um, I think it's good to start with the simplicity. So right now we are saying that for these collaboration tools, we aim at doing a one-to-one -one mapping between groups and kind of rooms where you are collaborating uh, to make it uh, easier to work with, both to understand for the end user, but also for, for yeah. So, but that might change in the future. I, I'm not sure. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, then I would like a very big hand for all our speakers today. Thank you.